If you've been around the alluvial prospecting community for more than five minutes, you would have heard people advise you to dig in areas of low pressure as the best places to find gold. I've only got two problems with this advice. The first is that as gold is traveling downstream, carried along by the flow, where it ends up being deposited has got absolutely nothing to do with pressure. And the second problem I've got with it is that the areas where you're being taught to look because they are low pressure zones, like behind an obstruction, like a big rock sitting in the middle of a stream, or on the inside corner of a bend in the flow, or even behind the riffles in your sluice. Those are all examples of high pressure, not low pressure. And so the whole premise on which the advice is based, the whole premise on which this low pressure model of predicting where are the best places to dig for gold, is wrong. In the next couple of videos, we're gonna be looking at the science as to why this is so. I'm gonna be going through some demonstrations to show you that science in action so it's easier for you to visualize. And we'll talk about how we can use this information to help us find more gold faster and more efficiently. G'day, welcome to Man Scientist Prospecting. My name's Stuart Chignall and this is episode eight of the fluid dynamics of prospecting. Now I've shied away from this issue, this topic for a little while. I've sort of skirted around it, but based on some of the comments that I've been getting, particularly on Facebook, I don't think I can do that anymore. I've got to go straight to it and just deal with this, with the whole fundamental flaw of the low pressure model is that the low pressure areas where you're being told to look are not low pressure areas. So what I'm really hoping with this video is that by showing you that the areas you've been taught to look in are in fact areas of higher pressure, that will finally get people to start to examine what they're doing, examine what they're being taught, and realize that pressure has nothing to do with gold, where gold is deposited. And if we can get that through, then I think we can really start moving forward and using some more accurate scientific models to find more gold. Now, we've talked previously about the conservation of mass in flowing systems. That was episodes, I think, one, two, and three. But to understand the relationship between the velocity of water and pressure, we've got to talk about the conservation of energy. And for you to more easily understand that, we've got to talk about how energy is, can be transformed from one form to another. All right, now I want you to imagine a reservoir. And in that reservoir, there's a whole stack of water. And the water in that reservoir has energy stored in two different forms. The first one is temperature. Not temperature, damn it, it's heat. Now, temperature is pretty much irrelevant for what we're talking about in this video, so I'm not gonna mention it again. The second form of energy that the water has stored in it is potential energy, or more specifically, gravitational energy. Now, this reservoir is filling up. It's got uh, a whole bunch of creeks and little rivers flowing into it, it's been raining, and they're, they're delivering water to the reservoir and it's getting full. And the engineers who are in charge of the hydroelectric scheme that's connected to that reservoir have decided they're gonna open things up a little bit and generate some electricity. Except they're not generating electricity. What they're doing is transferring the potential energy in the water into electricity. But before they do that, the energy has to transform through several other steps in order to get to being electricity. And this is where it comes into the pressure. Now they're very clever engineers, so what they've managed to do is open the valves to the hydroelectric turbines just enough to equal the amount of flow that is coming into the reservoir. What he means there is that, th that these engineers are very clever. These particular hypothetical engineers are very clever, and not even necessarily very clever. They're just very good at controlling the valves so that they can control the flow, so it exactly equals the amount of water coming in. And of course we know that this isn't really possible in real life. Not that it's not possible to have clever engineers, it is. It's just, it's, <laughs> it's not possible to balance the flows like that. That means that the depth of the reservoir is not changing. And that means that the pressure at the bottom of the reservoir where the outlet feeds into the electric turbines isn't changing. If the depth isn't changing, then the pressure won't be changing. So where that water is sitting at the bottom, the pressure is, equal, is determined by the depth and the gravity constant and the density of the water, and, you know, et cetera. But there's another form of energy that's involved in this process, and that is kinetic energy, movement energy. 
Now you would know that you can't create energy. You can't make energy. You just transform it from one form to another. How does this relate to pressure? Well, pressure is an indicator of potential energy. The deeper you go in a water body, the more pressure you get. And that indicates that there is more potential energy present in the water. If the pressure drops, that's an indication that the potential energy has dropped. Now what that means is that as the water starts to move towards the outlet of the reservoir and then into the outlet of the reservoir, it is picking up speed, it's picking up velocity. It now has, and once it's moving, it has a proportion of its energy is in the form of kinetic energy. That kinetic energy had to come from somewhere and where it came from was from the potential energy of the water. That means the potential energy of the water is now less, which means its pressure is less. And as that water starts flowing through this massive pipe in the outlet towards the hydroelectric dams, it's moving at a speed which isn't too fast, but that speed has reduced the pressure in the water. If the, if the pipe is on the same level as the, as, the, as the bottom of the reservoir, say, then the pressure in the pipe is gonna be less than the pressure in the reservoir away from the outlet where the water is still. Now, hydroelectric systems need a certain velocity of water in order to operate efficiently. So before the uh, water gets to the, to, the, to the hydroelectric turbine, the pipe narrows quite dramatically to increase the velocity of the water. This has a relatively dramatic effect on the pressure, lowering it substantially because now the water is moving quite fast, it's got a lot of kinetic energy, which means there has to have been a substantial drop in the potential energy, which results in a substantial drop in the pressure. So whenever you have a system and there is a change in the velocity, there is also a change in the pressure. Once the water has gone through the turbine, it loses a substantial amount of energy because that's been taken off in the form of movement of the turbine, whole stack of heat and friction and electricity. And then afterwards, it's the you because you want as little friction downstream of a hydro of a hydroelectric turbine as possible. You widen the pipe after the turbine as much as you can afford to. That means the velocity slows down, and that means you get a pressure increase as the water loses kinetic energy but gains potential energy. Uh, so you can better visualise this, and you're not just working on theory. I've got a bit of a setup to show you over here. I just gotta unconnect the garden hose. Ah! It's a um, good idea to relieve the water pressure before you do that. Right. Now I just want to turn this on a little bit. So we've got the town water, which has got a substantial pressure, much more than I'm used to in the um, domestic water because you know, I'm a farm boy and I'm used to gravity fed tanks. So full on pressure, flowing through a 25 mil pipe being reduced to into a 19 mil pipe and then into a 13 mil pipe. From the 13 mil we got this T, got a sight glass here and we can start to see the water there. It's starting the pipe starting to fill up. And then we've got a 19 increase goes from the 13 mil to the 19 mil. Got a T off, same sight glass, 19 mil into 25 mil again junction, sight glass, and then we've got a length of pipe where it then flows off to. The pipe here is higher, which means we're gonna get a buildup of water down here, possibly not to showing here. So I'm just gonna lift the end of that a little bit. So I've raised the end of the pipe up, and with the water on a trickle, the it is filled up to that level on the sight glasses, but it's not very clear. Hmm, that's a little bit better. Now we've got this pipe full of water. The, the tap's turned off. Uh, because the this pipe is going uphill, uh, this joint here is lower, which means the water level that you can, the water that you can see here in sight glass is more, less, and least of all. But the pressure here and here and here is all equal because these tubes are open to the air. The water pressure here will be higher because this pipe here is lower, and it will be less 
pressure up here because this bit of the pipe is higher. But watch what happens as we start to increase the flow. So we've now got a flow of water going through. First thing you'll notice is that the water level's gone up. Now the reason the water level's gone up is that now there is flowing water through the pipe. There is more friction in the pipe and particularly the friction between this joint here and where the water is exiting the pipe. Now that friction is often mistakenly called back pressure. It's got nothing to do with pressure. It's all about friction. But to overcome that friction, to get that to get that volume of water through this pipe, you need this amount of water pressure. Now we're increasing the, the flow again. That's a substantial increase of flow. I've really, I've, I've opened it up quite a bit there. You can see there's a lot more water coming out there, which unfortunately is a bit of a waste. So I've got to do this quickly. But now see, we've got, more, we've got more water exposed here, more pressure, but this water level is now lower than this one. And this one is now lower than that one. Now watch what happens when I really open things up. Now how obvious is that? Not very obvious at all. Is that better? All right, so you've got pressure down here is quite low relative to this one, which is higher, whereas that one is higher again. Now, I haven't moved the camera. I, you, you, the camera was on the tubes as I was turning the pipe up. So this isn't, a, this isn't any shenanigans with changing camera angles or nothing. This is level. Now, at the moment, I've got the end of that pipe slightly elevated. I want to show you something that happens when I reduce that. So I've got that down as low as I can go. And look what's happening over here. Pressure's highest here, mid-level here. But look at this. Now what's going on here is the air pressure is causing, the, the water pressure is higher here and it's it's better able to it's, it's res resist the air pressure. The water pressure is lower here, so the air pressure is pushing down, keeping this water level low. Here, it's even lower, and look what's starting to happen there. Not only do we have a low water pressure, but because of the turbulence here, we've got a, uh, a rotational effect being imparted to the water here. That's causing the water to spin, and you see this effect that's causing a low water pressure in the center of the tube. And you see this sort of stuff in your, you know, in your bath every time you pull the plug. But it's caused by high velocity water moving in a circle, creating a low pressure area in the center. So I hope you can see from that example how intimately pressure and velocity are linked. Water going through the 30 mil pipe has the highest velocity, which means it has the correspondingly lowest pressure. So low in fact that the air pressure was pushing in and introducing itself into the flow. And that's called a venturi. Huh. And for you guys who operate dredges, this is the principle you use to extract your pay dirt from the riverbed. You have a high velocity flow of water which has low pressure. Then the surrounding water pressure in which you're you know, diving, operating your dredge in, then pushes water through into that low pressure zone. And in doing so, it entrains a whole stack of gravels and particles and hopefully gold, goes into the hose and then gets carried up onto your barge and then delivered to your dredge mat. So I look forward to any of your questions or anything that needs clarifying, just sing out. In the next video, we're gonna be looking at some real world examples because I know there's gonna be people saying, oh, it's different in creeks and rivers. It's not, it's science. It's, <laughs> science is universal. If it's not correct across all situations, then the science is either wrong 
or incomplete. So in the next video, yes, we're going to look at some real world examples and get your head around air pressure and its involvement with water, especially flowing water in open channels. And it'll be easy to see what's going on when I, when I point it out. I also got a, another video coming out really shortly uh, about the mine outside my front door. Um, it's looking, again, it's looking more and more like a mine. I've done, I made a homemade seismograph to, to do some vibrational testing to try and map out the hollow area. And that'll be, there's a video coming out on that shortly. So anyway, stay tuned, catch you guys soon, and um, see you then.